Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. This interview first took place in November of 2022. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about switchcraft, the virtues of mental agility, with my guest, Dr. Elaine Fox. She is a psychologist, author, and the head of the School of Psychology at the University of Adelaide in Australia. Prior to her move to Australia, Dr. Fox founded and directed the Oxford Center for Emotions and Effective Neuroscience, also known as OCEAN, at the University of Oxford, a renowned research center exploring the nature of resilience and mental well-being. Dr. Fox is a cognitive psychologist by training. She is a leading mental health researcher combining genetics, psychology, and neuroscience in her work, and I am thrilled to have her in the house to talk about her newest book, Switchcraft, The Hidden Power of Mental Agility. Elaine, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hi, Lisa. Wonderful um, to be here. And thanks very much for having me on. Oh, my gosh. It is a pleasure because, I, firstly, I love this subject matter, you know, the agile okay. mind. You know, what can we do? We can teach old dogs new tricks, right? Yes, absolutely. Exactly. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, agility is, is so central to um, resilience and just being resilient and, and to being adaptable. Um, and, you know, I first kind of, uh, I mean, I've been working on this research for, for many years, actually, Lisa. But if I can tell you just a little story uh, to start, I, it, it made me laugh out loud on a train in London, actually, many years ago. I was reading a story about a group of friends a uh, incompetent armed robbers who were uh, um, robbing a, um, a, a, a grocery store. And um, one of the robbers was actually a bus driver and they were using his bus as the getaway vehicle. And when the police were tracking them afterwards, when they were trying to get away, they realised that the bus was actually following its usual route. <laughs> so rather, <laughs> rather than necessarily getting the fastest way away, it was actually going its normal route. So they were obviously apprehended very easily. But, you know, it made me think, it made me laugh out loud, but it made made me think that actually there's a fundamental psychological truth in there because of course when we get very stressed when we get very anxious we tend to refer to the familiar and we tend to think and, and think and behave in a very rigid kind of way so the more we can get rid of that rigidity and be agile the more uh, successful and adaptable we'll tend to be isn't that the definition of insanity, right? When you're doing the same thing over and over again, expecting <laughs> well, a different crazy, result. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the importance of switchcrafting and defining what it means to be a switchcrafter. Exactly. Well, I mean, switchcraft is a word I obviously kind of made up. But again, I have to thank my, my husband, Kevin, for, for coming up with the title, which I think is a great title because the book is really about, you know, when do we stick with what we're doing and when do we switch? There's times we really have to make that decision to switch. So switchcraft is really it's a set of mental talents, as I call them. Um, or mental tools, if you like, to help us cope in a very uncertain world. Because the reality is we do live in a deeply uncertain world. And it's always been like that. It feels very, very uncertain at the moment. We obviously have the war in Ukraine. We've had the COVID pandemic. We've had political upheaval all around the world. 
Um, but actually, if we think about it, you know, I mean, you or I, Lisa, wouldn't be here uh, today if our ancestors um, hadn't been very agile because they had to deal with lots of uncertainty and previous generations have lived through wars and famines and earthquakes and, you know, all sorts of disasters. So switchcraft is really the set of mental tools that help us cope with such an uncertain world. I like that you said that it's not any more uncertain than it has been in the past, right? We we like to think because we're getting our information in a 24-hour cycle, you know, or minute by minute, we're getting all of these updates that we're in greater peril today than we were yesterday. But when in fact, it's the availability of the information that is more rapid, not the actual risk. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely the case. And in many ways, I think there's probably less risk nowadays. And I think when something like the coronavirus pandemic happens, it, it kind of brings our own vulnerability. Uh, you know, we, we come face to face with that um, much more than we're, we're used to. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, a lot of people think that I wrote Switchcraft in response to the coronavirus pandemic, but actually I started this way, way before any of us had heard of coronavirus because um, I've been researching really agility and and mental flexibility for a long time. Um, and be because of that point, because, you know, if you just think of everyday things, we never really know when we're going to get sick, you know, when a friend is going to die, when, you know, I mean, bad things happen all the time and upsetting things happen. And um, so life is inherently uncertain. And of course, it does feel even more so now because because of all the, the things we mentioned with pandemics and all the rest of it. But actually, if you think back to previous generations, you know, there were world wars, there were major pandemics, uh, um, before, you know, in, a, in much more serious pandemics, like yeah. the Black Death in Europe, for example, um, when we didn't have very good medical science. And, uh, you know, so actually in many ways, um, even though it feels really uncertain, I think you're right. It's just the availability is is is, is very instant for us. You know, we can look at our phones, we can just look at the television, the computer. It's a 24-hour cycle. So, uh, you know, it's constantly there and, and we feel very vulnerable. But actually the reality is it's it's kind of a fact of life, really. I like your approach. It's very optimistic too. You know that it, it, it and, and of course that is part of what switchcraft is about, right? It is one of the skills that we need in order to navigate. Absolutely. And that's, um, you know, one of the things I really try to do in Switchcraft is really make the point that not only can we cope in very tough times and very uncertain times, but we can really thrive. We can really learn to thrive um, in, in those kind of times. Um, and I often use the analogy of um, a golf playing golf because um, the idea in Switchcraft is really that there isn't one size fits all. There's no one technique or psychological trick we can use that will work for everything in life. Um, and just if you think of a golfer going on to a golf course with a big bag of clubs, you know, I often think, oh, they carry so many heavy clubs around this golf course. Um, but actually, if you think about it, they need that because if you're taking a very long shot, you need a driver to help you. You know, if, if you're on the putting green, you need a different type of uh, shot. If you're in the bunker, you need a different type of club to help you. If a golfer went out on the golf club with just one golf club. They'd be brilliant on one type of shot, but actually they'd really struggle on most of the golf course. And, and kind of life is a bit like that. If you think of it in terms of we have different psychological techniques, different tools, which are great for certain situations, but absolutely not great for other situations. So things like mindfulness and um, growth mindset and um, grittiness, you know, all of these things are really good. There's a really good evidence base, but they're not good for every single situation we're likely to face. So the, the message in Switchcraft is really we need a variety of techniques, a variety of tools, if you like. And then we need to get the skill of, of knowing when to use the right tool for the right situation. In Switchcraft, you talk about four powerful psychological talents, and I have not often heard of psychological skills as being talents, and they are, and I would love for you to share them. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because I, I kind of came up with using the word talent because I was using tool and I thought tool sounds a bit harsh to me. And I thought, well, what am I really talking about here? And I think 
you know, I really do think these are talents. Um, so the four kind of, as I call them in the book, um, pillars really of switchcraft are the first one is agility, which we've mentioned already. And, and arguably that's probably the most important. So the ability to be very flexible and to respond in a reflexive way to different situations we're faced with. But of course, it's not agility for just its own sake. There's no point just changing just for the sake of it. So that agility is informed by the other three talents, if you like. Um, and one of those is self-awareness. So really getting a deeper understanding of ourselves, really digging deeply into what drives us. You know, what makes you happy deep down? What are your inner benchmarks of your happiness? And I think the pandemic has made many people rethink their lives. So you know, really understanding ourselves in a deeper way is really important. So that's one of the talents um, that kind of bolters our agility. Um, another is situational awareness. Um, so just being aware of our surroundings and the context we're in. Again, many of us go around um, really not noticing the world around us. You know, sometimes people are literally stuck looking at their phones as they're walking along the street. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of the time we're actually a bit blind. We often kind of, we, we kind of look at the world and, and, and think, it's it's as we want it to be rather than actually what it is, you know. Um, so it, it's really tuning into the surroundings and trying to get a deeper understanding of the context and what really matters to the people around us. Um, and, and that helps us to behave in, in, in the most appropriate way. And then the, the final one is emotional awareness, which is kind of part of, of self-awareness, but it's a separate thing, I think, because really embracing all of our emotions, our negative emotions as well as the positive emotions. Yeah. It's so important because that helps us tune into our intuition as well. It helps us tune into our body. Um, and so, so those four things, agility, being aware of ourselves, being aware of our situation and being aware and understanding our emotions. They're the four pillars or, or talents, if you like, of switchcraft. And these can be cultivated. You know, we might not start out possessing high levels of all of these, but we can train through practice to absolutely. gain more intelligence in these areas. That's absolutely right. And, and all of these and, and what um, I hope I've done, I think the Switchcraft, uh, you know, is, is packed full of tips and techniques and exercises that people can use to try and strengthen each of these different talents. Um, so things like, for example, in self-awareness, there's different tasks there, how we can learn how to become better at really developing an awareness of ourselves. And we could do that at a fairly superficial level in terms of testing our kind of personality, if you like. People love kind of testing their personality tendencies, which is an interesting kind of level of understanding, but it's actually quite superficial. Um, there's a, an American psychology, uh, Don Abrams, who um, you know, talks about uh, personality as, as being the psychology of the stranger. Um, and it's, it's, in other words, what he's saying is that, you know, we, it's, we can understand ourselves in the same way we would understand a stranger by just knowing our personality tendencies uh -huh. so so it's really kind of interesting so to go much um, deeper we um we need to go into a personal narrative so you know so i have four methods in the in those kind of chapters on self-awareness and developing your your personal narrative the stories that mean something to you on a personal level that will give you a much much deeper understanding of yourself so there's tasks in there so for example a simple one might be you know you could look back to say a situation that maybe the, the highest point in your life or the lowest point in your life and just sit down and write out about a hundred words just describing that in as much detail as you can and by kind of really thinking of those stories that have a personal meaning to you you can really get a deeper understanding of of yourself and what is really driving you and what's what's really important to you. So it's a much deeper level of analysis than a personality. And then I've got a whole section in there on just tuning into our body a bit, because I think a lot of us in the modern world have, have tuned out, if you like, of, of our body. And, and actually, our physiology is giving us a lot of information all of the time, which can be really helpful, again, as I mentioned, for our intuition. Um, so simply learning to, to just you know, if you like, quieten our mind a little bit and just listen to what our body is telling us can be so, so important. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Dr. Elaine Fox. We're talking about switchcraft, the hidden power of mental agility. To learn more, please go to harpercollins.com and check out Switchcraft by Elaine Fox on Twitter at Prof Elaine Fox and on Instagram. That handle is the same at Prof Elaine Fox. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. 
Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back with Dr. Elaine Fox. We're talking about switchcraft, the hidden power of mental agility. So, Elaine, let's talk a little bit about the importance of the openness to experience, because your work focuses on many different areas of fundamental science, including cognitive psychology and neuroscience. But what exactly does the openness to experience do for us? Well, openness to experience is is hugely in, important because, uh, you know, as we mentioned, it's very, very easy to become very rigid in how we think and in how we feel. And I, I actually call it mental arthritis in, in Switchcraft <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it, it is a bit like that. We, and it, it, it happens to all of us. You know, we, we resist change. We don't really like to change. Um, so openness to experience is really about genuinely looking out into the world and saying, OK, I'll try out different things to try and just... If you like, open up your mind a bit, open up your brain a little bit, because we, we have no chance really of um, of becoming more agile if, if we have a closed mind. So and, you know, so when we look at resilience and look at people who are very agile, one of the key factors that people who are very agile um, have is that they tend to be very open and openness to experience is one of the big five personality traits. So you probably know the big five, which is things like extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, which is kind of grittiness. And openness to experience is one of those big five, which explains kind of human personality, if you like. Um, and things like so people who are very high in openness to experience, <clears throat> excuse me, they have a very wide range of interests. They tend to be, you know, very intellectually curious about things. So, so they're easily bored, really. That's one of the downsides, if you like, of being very open. You could be easily bored and, and always looking for new experiences, often quite introspective. But the most important thing in terms of switchcraft is people who are open to experience tend to be much more comfortable with uncertainty. And as you said, the, the world is really uncertain. And so the more comfortable we can be with that, the more likely we are to come up with good ways of coping with it. Well, you know, in a certain sense, uncertainty is the only guarantee, right? Everything else is not a guarantee. We can be certain that things will change, they will be different, and that life is filled with uncertainty. I mean, that's kind of a, a promise. Exactly. And that's <laughs> absolutely, that's absolutely right. It's, it's one of the reasons I wrote Switchcraft, to be honest, Lisa, because I think, you know, a, a lot of us kind of desperately try and resist change, even though we all know that actually, you know, uncertainty is 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 certain. You're right. It's, it's absolutely one of those things that is guaranteed. So we have to just face that and say, OK, life is going to be uncertain. Unexpected things will happen. So how do we best deal with that? So rather than putting our heads in the sand and saying, I'm going to try and keep things at the same as as, as ever, you know, and, and I, a lot of my work in the early days was with people with quite high levels of anxiety and, and worry. And one of the things about very, very anxious people is that they absolutely try and control every aspect of their lives, um, which to some extent that can be a good thing. I mean, we all try to make our life as kind of predictable and as kind of, you know, organized as possible. But of course, the reality is you can't do that totally. You can't, you know, unexpected things just do happen. So the problem for a lot of anxious people is because they try to control every single aspect of their lives, as soon as one even tiny thing goes wrong, everything kind of tends to collapse and they kind of think, oh, you know, it's all gone wrong and they, they go into a spiral. So I think really accepting, genuinely accepting that, you know, unexpected things are going to happen. Life is uncertain. So how, how best do we deal with that? That's really the question I think we have to face. And that's the question I hope uh, Switchcraft answers. It gives people lots of tools to help them deal with that. Let's talk about intellectual humility, because this is a subject that is being written about quite a bit, spoken about quite a bit, at least in the U.S., and I love this term. Yes. Well, it's a really, really interesting, and it's it's part of openness. So um, part of openness is the idea that 
being genuinely accepting of the fact that you might be wrong. You know, I might actually be wrong. Now, none of us like that. Again, we all like to say, go, I've got it right. Um, but so intellectual humility is simply that stance saying that, you know, actually, maybe I have got it wrong. Maybe there's new evidence has come in that, you know, I need to look at the world in a different way. Um, and I think it, it's just a really important aspect. As you said, it's becoming quite a hot topic in psychology now. The idea that, you know, humbleness, intellectual humbleness is actually very, very important. Um, and there's lots of interesting work on that. So a lot of research, for example, has found that um, people who are high in intellectual uh, humility are much more tolerant of ambiguity. So, as we said, that's one of the important abilities to get through very tough times is just to be used to uncertainty and, and being able to handle ambiguity and uncertainty. So those who are intellectually humble, because they have a genuine sense that they don't know everything, um, they tend to be much more tolerant of ambiguity and realise that you know they may need to find out more information about things. But people who are less intellectually humble um, tend to be very resistant to any new information. They tend to just simply think they are, are right already and you know that's that's it. So one of the downsides of humbleness, of course, is that it can appear sometimes that you're not as confident as you might be. So, for, so a lot of politicians, and I won't mention any names, but I think we all <laughs> we all know we all know a few. Yes, we know <laughs> so, who that is. <laughs> so they definitely are not intellectually humble. Probably the opposite. Um, but you know, just looking at a broader range of, of politicians and leaders around the world, it, the, there is research showing that actually it can actually backfire against people when they're going for elections, for example, if they kind of admit that actually, yeah, they may not know everything about a certain topic or they may be wrong on something, that can come across sometimes as being a bit indecisive. Um, even though overall we, we know that um, decision making is actually generally better if people are intellectually humble because they're more open to information and therefore more likely to, to get the right information, really. Let me ask you a question about intellectual humility versus intellectual arrogance and age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find in your research and in working with younger students that younger people tend to be more intellectually humble or less or vice versa? I think it's it's interesting. I haven't actually researched that precise question, so I can't really give you a kind of scientifically valid answer. But but certainly my impression is that younger people are much more um, intellectually humble. They, they, you know, and obviously if you look at children, children don't know a lot of information, so they're very open to new information. They kind of realise that. And I think as we get older, we get more entrenched in our beliefs, um, and that's when I think your mind literally starts closing, if you like. Um, and and I think definitely it is the case as, as people get older um they do tend to get a little bit more it, it's kind of the same as rigidity and how we think it's it's just you know you, you you kind of you're very resistant to change your your long-held beliefs and but people do do that you know and i know with my own mother for example it's quite interesting because i was brought up in in ireland in in dublin and when i was a young child it was a very very religious country, almost a fundamentalist country, a Catholic country. And my mother had been quite religious all her life. But because of all the scandals that had come up about you know, sex abuse in the church and everything, she, she really, really found it difficult to change. Like she, her view was that every single priest or, you know, you met was a really, good, a, a really good man. And I think it took her a long time to accept that actually that's not always the case. Yeah, most of them probably are, but actually there are some people who aren't. And it, I remember I almost saw that in her kind of as she was getting older and older, she suddenly, you know, opened her eyes and thought, actually, you know, you, you do need to change. So so I think, you know, obviously we, we do get a bit more set in our ways as we get older. And, and when we see somebody who is much more open like that and, and intellectually humble as they get older, it's, it's quite a, it's very refreshing, actually. You know, there's a few people I have met who are in their 80s and who are, you know, extremely, they're still open to all sorts of new things. They still think, oh, I've probably got that wrong. Um, and it's actually very, very refreshing. But I think you're right in general. I think there's no doubt that all of us just get a bit more set in our ways as we get older. And, and in a sense, that's what Switchcraft is all about, is trying to resist that as much as we can and, and just try to keep our mind as fluid and as open as, as possible. Well, it's definitely an attractive quality in another person. You know, when Absolutely. you see somebody yeah. who is intellectually humble and at the same time, very self-possessed, right? They know who they are and they know what they, they don't know, or they know what they do know and they know what they don't know. And they're willing to 
say it. Absolutely. I, yeah, I find it very, very attractive. I want to just talk about one of your earlier books, which is called Rainy Brain, Sunny Brain. It was an international bestseller, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Great. Well, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so um, Rainy Brain, Sunny Brain came out, um, I think it was in about 2012. Um, but I think it's still, it's, it, it's about my own research on really asking the question, you know, why are some of us optimists and why are some of us pessimists? And what are the different traits and what are the different elements of that? So it's, I, I wrote it in many ways um, to get away from this idea that, uh, you know, happiness and well-being can, can be gained only through positive thinking. So I think a lot of self-help books tell you, if you think happy thoughts, <laughs> everything will be wonderful. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> not. The, the, no, absolutely. And, and the psychological research shows us that that's, of course, not the case, that it's it's actually more about psychological actions in many ways and, yeah. and action, po sorry, positive actions rather than um, positive thinking necessarily. Positive thinking is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not the only thing. If, you know, you have a situation where you, there's a lump somewhere, for example, and if you just think happy thoughts, the chances are that's not going to be very successful. Whereas if you go to a doctor and get it checked out, you know, then you have some chance, hopefully, of, you know, things being resolved. Um, so I realized in the psychological research, there's about a number of different components to optimism um, and many of those other components. So one of them is positive thinking. One of them is positive action. So actually taking positive actions like going and checking out a medical condition, for example. Um, but there's also things like just tenacity. So there's a wonderful experiment if I've time to explain it. It's not one of my own, but it's one I use every year with my um, undergraduate students as a lab task. And what you do is you simply divide people into optimists and pessimists based on a questionnaire measure. And then we give them a test of, you know, these anagram tests where you have, say, five letters jumbled up and people have to come up with an English word as quickly as they can. Yes, so, I know those. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's all you have to do. So people have to, uh, five letters come up on the computer screen and they have to come up with a word as quickly as they can. And then once they do that, another word comes up and this goes on. Um, and so what we do is when we get to about four or five um, it's actually an impossible anagram. So five letters come up where there's actually no possible word that 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 people can resolve. Now, obviously, as students, particularly in Oxford, when I was doing this in Oxford, people are extremely competitive. So people really try and figure out the word before they give up. And so the simple measure is how long does it take people before they give up? And it's one of those studies that it's unbelievable. It replicates every time when you do it in a lab class. What you find is when you look at the results, the optimists, the people who have scored on the opt higher on the optimism, tend to take significantly longer, about 20 to 30 percent longer before they give up than the pessimists. So that's, wow. nothing, to do with, that's nothing to do with positive thinking. It's, you know, it's, it's actually all to do with simple tenacity, just sticking with something for a little bit longer. And of course, you know, that's why optimism is often related to success in business, for example. Um, it's nothing to do with positive thinking. It's, it's well, I would say nothing, but it's, it's, it's not all to do with positive thinking. It's very much to do with these kind of other components like tenacity, positive actions. Um, and, and the other thing, which I, we probably won't have time to go into, but is a sense of control. So optimists tend to have a much stronger sense that they have some control over their own destiny. And there's some very oh. nice exper experiments looking at that. And, and, and we know that that's very empowering. And, and the interesting thing, Lisa, is even if it's wrong, even if you don't actually have much control over the world around you, if you think you have at least some control, and that actually is very empowering and very good for your general health and well-being. I wanted to go back to the stick to itiveness of the optimists in in the uh, in finding the word, because the words higher distress tolerance come to mind. That the optimists may possess that stick to itiveness and be able to tolerate their frustration a little bit longer than the pessimist. Absolutely, and, and that is absolutely true. There's, there's a lot of evidence for that, and and of course it loops back to what we were talking about in terms of uncertainty. You know, it's, it's just being a bit more comfortable with uncertainty. And and there is some evidence that um, that's the case with optimists, that you know, they are just a little bit more comfortable um, with a lot of uncertainty. And so therefore, they're able to step back a bit and try and find a workaround and try and find a solution to whatever the problem is, where people who are more pessimistic, they tend to be quite rigid in how they go about solving problems. So if they're if they're if whatever technique they're using isn't successful, they'll tend to give up. So whereas an optimist will say, okay, that doesn't work, so let's try something else and maybe try something else. So it's, again, it's about you know being a bit more open, being a bit more agile, 
and and resisting that kind of rigidity of just using one or two techniques. The other thing I wanted to mention, you were talking about control over our destiny, that optimists seem to possess, whether it's the illusion or the belief. I don't know what is actually true, but is it maybe it's just control over attitude? The optimist <laughs> chooses that perspective. It, that's a really interesting point, actually. And I think you're right. I think a lot of the time it is choice, choice to say, OK, do I have something to control? And and one of the things we often advise people when you're dealing with a crisis, for example, is the very first thing, as you know, Lisa, is you ask yourself, well, what can I control and what can I not control? And I think the problem is a lot of times people try and control things they can't control. So, um, you know, but actually there, there'll almost certainly be something that you can have some control over. So focusing on that is a much more positive way forward. Um, so it is about kind of attitude to sense. But it's, it's also, if, do I have time to just say, to tell you a little experiment that was done? That... Quick, quick, quick. Yes. Okay. <laughs> very, very quickly. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the person who did this, but it, it was a, a, an American study that was done. And it was done in a, um, a nursing home, so for aged care. Um, and so uh, there were a lot of elderly people there. And very quickly, the researchers gave everybody a pot plant. And a, Ellen Langer. A, a, it was Ellen Langer at Harvard. Oh, Langer, yeah, you know the study. Yes, you know the study. So the, the, basically the bottom line of the study was that some of the residents were told that they had to um, look after the plant themselves and they could watch their movie, their video, any time they, they wanted to. Whereas uh, some of the other residents, it was just looked after by the nursing staff. So they didn't have any control. And what they found was really quite dramatic results in that not only did, um, you know, were people physically much healthier who had some control over their pot plant, a simple level of control, they actually lived a lot longer. So the longevity differences were actually different be, between them. So so that was a really nice study that really showed in a very dramatic way how just having that small amount of control over something in your life made a huge difference. Yeah, I do remember that study. And she is great. Her work is so She's good. Great, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely wonderful. It's a lovely, lovely study, actually. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we're out of time, but come back and hang out with me anytime because I am a fan of Switchcraft, The Hidden Power of Mental Agility. I love your work and this is good stuff that we all need to pay attention to. To learn more about Professor Elaine Fox, please go to harpercollins.com and check out Switchcraft Elaine Fox on Twitter and Instagram. That handle is at Prof Elaine Fox. Elaine, thank you so much. I want to hear more. I mean, I feel like your stories are endless. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. I really enjoyed it. I'd, I'd love to come back sometime. We're doing it. <laughs> Great. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Elaine Fox, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.